Hey everybody, this is Jarlo of GMB Fitness. GMB, of course, stands for Geezer's Mending Bones. That's Geezer's Mending Bones Fitness. Uh, really happy to have uh, Shane Dowd and Matt Chu here today. They're the FAI Fix guys. So Shane has is part gotrom.com, is that correct? Yeah. And uh, Matt from Upright Health. Uh, That's right. What, yep. We have them on here talking about hips, 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 hips. But specifically FAI, which is fem- femoral acetabular impingement, and that's a diagnosis some people get from you know, various medical professionals, and uh, they've done really well with their programs and helping people both in the programs and uh, you know, I was talking to Shane a little bit about you know private coaching and and all of that, and that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, Shane, how are you? You're in Colombia. I am doing well. I'm in Bogota, Colombia. Yes, recently awesome. married to a beautiful Colombian wife. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, the warmth there sounds pretty good to me. We've had a, a bad run of cold weather up here in Seattle. <laughs> yeah, it's a little yeah. different there. <laughs> right. And then, Matt, you're in, from the Bay Area, you said? We're really right in the heart of the uh, Silicon Valley. We're in Redwood City, um, and uh, it's been pretty cold and rainy uh, here recently too. And there's quite a flu running around. So, luckily, I've managed to stay mostly healthy. So. Yeah, I think San Francisco <laughs> is the Seattle of California, right? Is that, what it that is correct. <laughs> no, I, I think it's actually Seattle is the San Francisco. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> well, actually, I remember I was down in Monterey like a few years ago. We were doing a seminar, and it was. It was literally 30 degrees colder than than it was in Seattle at that point. It was like in oh, August. Yeah. I was like, what is this? California? Yeah. This is not it. It's not right. Yeah. 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 But uh, anyway, really happy to have you guys on. I think we can have a really nice conversation and help some people out. So first, yeah. Yeah. To, to get things started, what, what, what the heck is FAI? What is it? Um. Shall I field that one? Take it away. All right, here we go. So FAI, uh, you've already mentioned, Jarlo, it's uh, femoroacetabular impingement. Um, It's a kind of funny diagnosis. The idea is basically that your bone shapes in your hip joints are bad. Um, They're misshapen, and that results in you having hip pain. Um, it's a it's a diagnosis that was actually not in existence until the early 2000s um, when a hip surgeon uh, presented his idea in some published papers and um, said, hey, look, I can fix this. We just got to take people's femurs out and shave down some bones. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> so I have um, my own opinions about that, but I'll just let you guys <laughs> talk a little bit more. I definitely want to hear your opinions on it, too. <laughs> Um, but uh, basically yeah so the surgeon published some papers said we've already done hundreds of these surgeries uh, and it works pretty much every time and so other surgeons should do the same thing to fix hip problems um, and here's how you do it so since then it's kind of uh, it's, it's become a really big diagnosis for people and especially in like the fitness world, people who are doing like CrossFit and high volume, high intensity exercise, um, you know, when their hips start to hurt, a lot of times they'll go and get an x-ray and then an MRI and it says, hey, your bone shapes, not so good. That's the problem. Let's go in and fix it surgically. Right. Um, And I think here, I think Shane maybe is a good voice to take over because Shane has the bone shapes and, um, he hasn't had the surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically I, I'm the guy that Matt was just describing. The I, I was a Olympic weightlifting coach in a CrossFit gym as well as a strength coach and a corrective exercise kind of guy in the gym and massage therapist. And um, I kept re-injuring my back and um, my SI joint because um, sometimes these things don't always show up immediately in the hip. It's kind of in a related area. So my back kept getting injured and I didn't know why. Um, and at one point I was doing a power clean and got so injured in my back. And it, I have it on video. Like my form was perfectly neutral spine, braced. Stu McGill would be happy. <laughs> Everything was flawless in the technique. Um, but just because I did have some asymmetries in the rest of my body, I still ended up injuring myself and was like incapacitated for a month, had my girlfriend putting on my socks and shoes because I couldn't do it myself, all that stuff, which led me on this long journey of self-discovery 
to see what was wrong. And it turns out it wasn't the back, it was the hips. I was told I had FAI, ended up ultimately getting x-rays and MRIs and had cam morphology, which is a type of bony, quote unquote, deformity and um, labral tear, cyst, all that jazz in the hip. But as I just started kind of mindfully exploring movement, stretching, self-massage, physical therapy, tons of different options, um, I kind of came out of all my problems and um, and that's when Matt and I sort of crossed paths and ended up talking about, hey, I got funky hips. You got funky hips? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, and eventually we were like, hey, I think there's a lot of other people that got tight hips, bad hips, painful right. hips. We should help these people because we both kind of figured out um, a good methodology to help people with hip stuff. Right. Yeah, my, my hips were horrible uh, by the time I was in my mid-20s. It was... I mean, most people don't believe me, but I think more and more it's happening um, where our sedentary lives are getting young people into a lot of hip pain. And I was kind of part of that first generation right. of people just like, man, I can't I can't even jog one block because my hip and my knee are hurting so bad. Right. Um, so, yeah, for me, trying to that was a it was tough. It was really tough. And um you know, when I realized Shane also had such such issues, and we realized like, hey, there's a huge there's there's a huge demand for help here, because it's really hard to find reasonable non invasive help, um, really anywhere. I mean, it, it can be really difficult just going to the doctor. The answers, uh, from my perspective, were really unsatisfying. Sure, right? it was sure. Basically, just rest, right? Right, and I think. <laughs> Uh, you kind of hit on it a little bit earlier um, when you said, well, first of all, it's a kind of a new diagnosis, you know, in the last 20 years. And, uh, yeah, I actually remember actually when they came out with that because I was a couple of years out of PT school at that point. But mm. I think there's a couple of ways to think about this, too, is like, yes, the sedentary lifestyle and, you know, everyone's attached to the computers and their phones and all of that, too. But at the same time, you know, especially with the CrossFit phenomenon and, and all mm. this stuff and the movement, then they're being asked to do these activities which are fully new, right? Uh, Olympic right, weightlifting, right. all that stuff used to be, it still is niche, of course, but it's right. way more prevalent now than it used to be, right? <laughs> right. When you talk yeah. about a clean and jerk and a snatch now because of CrossFit and because of uh, all of these uh, now, not just like Gold's Gym or not, you know, about these kind of boutique things, people are more uh, aware of being able to squat, right? Being able to lunge, being able to to crawl around and do all these things. So it's less uh, less of a kind of a unique thing. So you, now you have this kind of confluence of people aren't doing things, right? They're sitting down all day, and then they're being asked to do these the really, hardest uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> so and I think that's that comes along with it, and then. Uh, what you said, Matt, about the dissatisfaction of going to a to a doctor or or even another you know healthcare professional that they'll, they'll give you drugs, right? They'll give you some Advil, tell you to rest, right? right? Or they'll to get, give you an X-ray and say, oh well, it's your bones. Right. No yeah. wonder it's mm -hmm. your bones. So that's right. my problem there because if pain science is is it's not true, it's absolutely right. not true. Right. I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, the, the pain science shows that it's bones are bone shapes. I mean, if we just look through medical history, there are so many examples where that's been the, the trajectory is initially a surgeon will say, oh, your back hurts. That's because the bone is rotting or the disc is bulging, whatever it is. And then 20, 30, 40 years later, you look at the science and they go, oh, Oh, maybe maybe the surgery wasn't such a good idea. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, we're at the twenty year mark with FAI roughly. So we'll see in the next ten years. Right, exactly. Exactly. And come on now, how much more invasive can you get than to cut into somebody's body and think, <laughs> okay, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. <laughs> now this is not to say and this is you know, I this is sort of rambling, but uh, you know, you guys see that and you talk about this all the time. <laughs> It's not to say, uh, so for example, Shane, you do have that morphology, right? You do have it. Right. So it does affect, say, your squat form, right? It, it affects mm -hmm. how you can generate power at different angles. So we're not saying mm -hmm. that, no, it doesn't exist. 
right? Mm. It doesn't exist that this bone shape in this particular way that your the head of your femur is seated in your pelvis doesn't affect how you move. It does. But then right. what, uh, what I like reading about from your guys' site and, and all your stuff is that, well, yes, you acknowledge that and then you do assessments and, and you, you work your way around it. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like that old, I'm not necessarily a religious guy, but the old serenity prayer of like, I think it's like, God grant me the thing or give me the wisdom. Or what is it? Let's see. Yeah. Um, let me change the things that I can uh, accept the things that I can't and the wisdom to know the difference. And so right. we're not saying that that bone shape doesn't matter whatsoever and every surgery is completely invalid and the only thing that matters is the, your muscles and movement. Um, but like I wrote in the kind of the article that we wrote about this for GMB that um, there's several things that matter, the bones and your muscles, their tissue quality, their extensibility, um, your motor control, the way you move. But the pendulum has swung so far in the direction of the bones are what matter most and surgery is the only thing that, that fixes it that we just keep kind of presenting the more middle path perspective of, hey, there's other things that matter in terms of pain and the way you move and how you feel. Right. Well, let's uh, bring this kind of back to a starting point of, say, so for someone listening. So we can, you can say that, okay, you've had some hip pain or you had some hip problems. And then, yes, you go to a doctor and they give you this diagnosis. There's also the other, uh, the other people where they haven't gone to the doctor yet. They're Googling. They're like, oh, man, maybe I got femoral <laughs> acetabular. Pen- yeah, the worst thing in the world, right? Mm. Don't go to WebMD and find out you have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> with everything cancer but so those that's the two perspectives for me is you've you've gotten the diagnosis again whether the diagnosis tells you anything or not and then or you have these problems that sort of fit the fai right maybe you you you, you squat down and you're like oh what's that pinching in the front of my hip so my question for you guys is what what are your kind of screenings right for for a person having uh any of these issues and and what what do they do from that mm. so that's a that's a super good question so um with our program and just the way i think all of us on this call work is to look at what somebody's function is right so um you know with the fai fix we have we have a num- I think it's 15 maybe 16 a bunch of self tests right um that basically give somebody an opportunity to test either a range of motion or test the strength of a group of muscles, test a specific movement pattern, and see how it feels and see whether they have the control, whether they have the extensibility, like Shane was saying, whether they have just a basic level of strength. Um, I think I, I think it's, um, it's, it's really important for people to realize just – how complicated like how complicated it can be like how much one muscle needs to be trained right like you know it's one thing to say like i always stretch my hamstrings right but then do you have hamstring strength right? Right. do you have the ability to use your hamstrings when they are stretched um so you know one of the big things that shane and i talked about when we first um created the program was really helping people differentiate between whether you're somebody who tends to be really loosey goosey and like really flexible and or if you're somebody who's you know doing so much weightlifting you can't touch your knees anymore without major compensations right, right? right and and so just kind of um helping people go through a number of different different motions that maybe they don't do in a in the normal day that they don't do at the gym but there are motions that are necessary that tell you whether muscles around the hip joint are capable of doing certain normal basic requirements um and and you start from there and i mean i'll be the first to tell you that the self tests don't cover every single possible right. scenario because your hips are capable of amazing amazing things um, so it's it's a really difficult to come up with the whole thousand self tests that would be be necessary. But right. um, yeah, but yeah, we just start off with some basic things and then go to some harder things so people can solve their own issues. And 
it's not dependent upon whether they have a diagnosis or not. It's just, what is your function? Let's start improving your function, and then let's see how your hips feel. Right. And I think that's that's massive because, uh, you know, bringing back to kind of physical therapy and where I came from. So I started school in 95, right? I finished in 98, you know, just over 20 years ago, and I've kind of gone through a bunch of this where it was either you have diagnosis-related, you know, impairments, right? Mm -hmm. You have... Uh, you know, specific spondylolisthesis, slow back pain, and then the pendulum swung over into straight up uh, the evidence-based, you know, can you do this movement, do this movement, right, versus a straight up diagnosis. And now you're, you know, we're coming back to, well, look at your control and your motor control. Over, and it's, it's hilarious to me because it just kind of goes back and forth. And this was one of the reasons why when I was reading you know, your material, it's like, this is it this makes sense to me. It's the same thing, you know, for people that are, have been in the GMB for a while, they, they know what we do is like, we have our thing, we, we, we assess, we address, we apply, and then we always circle back through it. So mm -hmm. what you're describing to me is just very familiar because it always comes down to it, to that, to me, you don't, you're not your diagnosis. Now, again, we're not saying, oh, that doesn't exist. We're saying, yes, you, perhaps you have bone changes. Perhaps you have, arthritic changes perhaps you have even cartilage damage but what are you going to do just give up <laughs> right <laughs> right and so this is what we mean by physical autonomy if we, if we do the correct things if we are patient with ourselves if we assess it and and don't get stuck right don't get stuck in our uh, our pathology that someone is telling us we have so um and that's one of the things i wanted to kind of draw out from you is like when someone comes up to you or even you know, messaged you or asked you about what they have. Like, I was told I have this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I was told I have this. I was told I can't do this, right? To me, those are the worst things ever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, tell me what I can do. <laughs> right. If, if you're a doctor or a therapist or, or personal trainer, you know, and you're telling someone you can't do this, man, you better tell them what to do otherwise or or um, you know, really explain it well, because otherwise you're just you're almost giving them a, a, a pronouncement. Yeah, it's a, it's a death sentence, is what yeah, it is. It's just right. just stop stop living your life. Is what stop that living is. your life. Oh, it hurts when you do that. Don't do that. Right, that yeah. old joke. It's terrible. And, it's terrible. I'd be amazed at how much a quote unquote diagnosis from a doctor or someone in a white coat or a physical therapist can impact the psyche of someone. Like oh, yeah. when I, when I actually got my x-rays and MRIs, it was mostly out of curiosity. I had already come out of my hip problems, but I was like, I'm going to go back and just see what the, what the imaging is. Got the x-ray and the MRI and stuff like that. And when I got the report back from the doctor and, and her voice sounded like so serious, like oh, you man. need to like, go, go get checked out. And I was like, and I, and I uh, read like the, the medical language and it was like right. subcon subchondral cyst on the bone and like all this stuff. And it like, it freaked me out, even though I had literally been like trail running and doing the splits like the right. day before and it had Absolutely. zero pain. Absolutely. Um, so if someone that doesn't have like more of a background, if they, if they receive some kind of quote unquote diagnosis like that, it can be very disempowering rather than empowering. Absolutely. Right. It's the nocebo, nocebo effect. Yeah, no yeah. SIBO. That's right. I, I, I had a, so after Shane did his, um, his investigation with the doctor, I, I went to go do one too, just to see what, uh, what kind of diagnosis I could get. And, um, and it was, it was really, it was a fascinating process. I, I got an x-ray, I got the MRI done. Um, and, and it, on many levels, I learned a lot of things from this process. I learned what it's like to even sit in an MRI machine for 30 or 45 minutes and yeah, i was just thinking wow if you already have hip pain and you're just lying here on this hard plinth on this little board for mm -hmm. 45 minutes that's not gonna feel good right. that's gonna make this worse but um to, to long story short um the the doctor that i saw was a sports medicine expert and he told me um after all this testing um he's like well you know, what's concerning is you, you do have some mild arthri arthritic changes in your hips. That's really concerning because you're in your, I think at the time I was in my mid-30s. He's like, that's really concerning that it's showing up so early. You should 
probably stop lifting weights, stop oh, wow. doing any kind of martial arts, stop running, stop doing all these things. Wow. And it was it was so interesting and it, it was like I, I I couldn't believe the things he was saying because he didn't have the context, right? Like for me, the context is like I stopped doing a lot of things in my uh, late teens and early 20s. And by my mid 20s, everything was worse. And things didn't get better until I was reintroducing movement and reintroducing, you know, mobility work, some stretching, some strength. I had to be doing all those things to build myself back up to being able to play hockey, to try doing capoeira, to do body weight stuff. Like that was what was making my hips feel better. And if I took his advice, I would just end up right back in that helpless, broken, chronic pain state. And, uh, and I was just, I was blown away. And I asked him like, well, you know, I was kind of testing to see what would happen. I was like, well, should I consider surgery? And, uh, and he was like, well, I, I'm actually, it turns out he's, he's a non-surgical sports medicine specialist. So he's like, I, I wouldn't tell you to get the surgery because, um, you know, you probably also have some labral tearing and, and you already have a little arthritis. So, you know, doing anything to your hip is probably not a good idea, but you should taking on every on all your activities because you don't want to damage it further. And so in my mind, I was thinking, wow, like the non-surgical specialist is just telling me to do nothing. Right. And that's just going to make me worse, too, to the point where you would end up eventually, if you're just the average person taking this advice, you're going to end up in way more pain and you're going to get into more of a panic as the pain gets worse. And that's when you end up making that choice of like, well, let me consult with the surgeon who's the joint expert who's going to hopefully fix this problem. Right. right. So right. I think a lot of it, just like you said, is, is it's contextual too. Like mm-hmm. you already went to, from a place where you weren't doing anything, going back to that, you're going to, is that going to suddenly change your, your symptoms? Right. Probably not. Probably not. Right. And right. I, I think I have to say this and we've said it more than once. Right. We're not saying don't go to the doctor. We're not saying don't go to your right. healthcare professional because there's a reason why you do it. And, and, uh, if you've been to therapy, all these things, they're, they're called red flags because it could be, right? It could be freaking cancer. It could be a tumor. It could be any of these things. You don't know. It could be your organs. Like there's a lot of reasons why we have pain, why we have these kind of referred symptoms and you just straight up got to make sure that you rule those out. But at the same mm-hmm. time, don't go there and go, okay, I'm ready for my surgery now. Right. I mean, right. This, right. This, yeah. These are the extreme yeah. things. These are extreme things, and we're not about extreme things. Right. <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to rule out the giant red flags. But I think for a lot of people, I think it's always helpful to remember those giant red flags are pretty rare. So right, exactly. Like as soon as if it's there, okay, you got to deal right. with that. If it's not there, then again, take your body into your own, you exactly. know, your own hands. Start right. fixing yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it, it, it's worth the appointment just to know that it's not that. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. at that point, you can do, you can make all of these other choices and decisions. You know, you can work with a, a PT, you can work with a trainer, you can work with a, you know, chiropractor or whatever you decide is best for you. And that, uh, that's a big part of uh, what I see from you guys too. Is this this kind of autonomy? It's choices. We all make choices for ourselves. Yeah. Right? Exactly. It's it's one one thing that I. Um, wrote in the article to go along with this podcast is that it's about um, empowering the person to become their own best therapist in the long run so that you don't, you don't have to go run to someone else to fix you when something breaks down and it's less mysterious. It's like, Oh my God, my hip hurts. And you just like cover your eyes and run to Jarlo and say, fix me. (laughs) It's, it's, you work with Jarlo because he has studied kinesiology, anatomy and biomechanics for years and can teach you some things that you don't know. And you also are learning what your body is asking for, what it needs, where it likes to move, where it doesn't like to move, how it likes to be kind of massaged, what muscles get tight. And the only way you can do that is with self-exploration, with massaging your body, stretching your body, strengthening your body. Yeah. Um, and it goes hand in hand with with working with a really competent professional. It's not one or the other. Right, absolutely. And then, uh, Shane, even before the call, we were talking about it, like, you know, you're in Colombia now. 
but you can do your work from where, wherever in the world. Same thing uh, on the opposite plane is uh, if you're a client, you're looking for things, you're not, uh, you're not uh, limited to your geographical area anymore. Right? Right. You can go and you can Google and you can search. You can look up you guys and, and work on it, on work on what you want to do. You can, and it's great. It's absolutely awesome. Can, can I interject something there? Um, uh, it's rare that I get this opportunity, uh, as it is for many people, to talk to the to somebody who was on YouTube who inspired them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, uh, this is actually something that we that that we tell clients a lot is you need to be looking at stuff that's inspiring you to move better. Um, and I, I clearly remember it's probably like five or six years ago. I remember watching a video of you, Jarlo doing like you're in a deep squat and you're doing hip rotations and doing oh. internal rotation. I, I remember like, that video. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, how come I can't do that? What is the deal? So that's, that is something that I constantly use. I'm like, have I gotten Jarlo level hip internal rotation <laughs> well, when I'm in a deep squat? So oh, yeah. Thanks. So thank you for that video. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, one of the things that, you know, if we talk a little bit more about this is, you know, uh, me and Ryan and Andy, you know, when we made this, basically in this space, this fitness space in the internet was very young at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, th this was 12 years ago or so. And so, you know, putting out YouTube videos like that or putting it like almost nobody, I don't say nobody was doing it, but it, it was now everyone is doing it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, and yep. it's, it's not unique and it's not. So when we were doing, we were like, oh, I'm just showing what I do. Uh, this right. is what I've been doing. And I were like, let's just put it up there. You know, maybe people find it interesting. And yeah, I'm always like, wow. It still amazes me now. Even like mm -hmm. 10 years later, I'm like, wow. Okay, well, this is great. And so this is kind of what we built it from. And, you know, thanks. Thanks for uh, being there too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. It was really helpful to... I think as a practical thing for people who are dealing with hip pain, whether they have some diagnosis or whatever, um, I, I think on a practical level, I think one of the most important things you can do is realize, realize that if you see somebody doing something with their hips, they're moving in some way, that you as a human being, as a fellow human being, have the capacity to do that same thing if you are willing to put in the time and the effort sure and and also knowing that your path to get to that may not be the same as what their path was um and i say that because i know sometimes people get stuck because maybe they see like hey jarlo can do this thing um let me just do the jarlo 3000 workout right, right? right. and that's going to make me jarlo right uh, that's wrong straight up wrong <laughs> yeah nobody Absolutely. can be jarlo straight up <laughs> <laughs> but well that's the, i mean and we always talk about this and and you you guys do in your materials too is you know work from where you are right you should have a goal you should have someone you want to emulate but you have to realize you know the adaptation the adjustments you have to make yeah you know they need to be done or else you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, right. It's funny because I just, uh, we're going to put up an advanced, you know, in quotes, hip mobility, stretches, routine. And what I, I'm doing it because some people need that, like a very yeah. small percentage. And you maybe, you know, probably you guys could benefit from it. Uh, I think I've shared some things on my Instagram the other day, but not everyone's going to be able to do it. Right. right? And, but, also, we have like beginner routines. We have other things like that. We have like the 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 level that you're at, but it's merely a demonstration. Like uh, I think, like what you meant to say, Matt. Like, wow, maybe I should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So, what kinds of things should I do to get to that point? Right. And that's right. more of what we're trying to do versus it's yeah. And that's what I mean by it's wrong. If you try to jump in <laughs> to some of this stuff, you know, Matt, that you do, Shane, you do, and and me it's not good man you're gonna make whatever you have worse and i don't want to answer those messages like no man i didn't say to do that <laughs> don't yeah. do that right uh so coming back a little bit more to uh so shane when you you were having the diagnosis and you're 
you're exploring these things. When, when was the, a point where you're like, oh, this is working, or if I keep doing this, like, did you have that kind of moment where like, oh, wow. I had thousands of little moments like that. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like, like what you were talking about earlier, how it's really important that you do kind of, when you're trying anything to make your hips better, a stretch, an exercise, a mobility drill, and this comes from physical therapy, the test and the retest, the take a before picture and an after picture and do it frequently to tell what is the exercise or the thing that's really helping. So I got in the habit early on of after before and after, like every mobility drill, I would, I would check in with my hips. I'd massage something, check in with my hips, do a stretch, check in with my hips. Um, and this allowed me to see that I was trending in a good direction. Um, it wasn't like one miracle moment where my hips went from terrible to like, they're healed, like praise Jesus. <laughs> it was just, it was like a lot of little micro moments where I'm like, oh, I'm trending in a good direction. There, there, are, there were some crashes, some like kind of setbacks, some stock market crashes, but I could still right. see if I looked at the bigger picture that, oh, this is going in a good direction. And slowly but surely as you get more skilled, as I got more skilled at doing tissue work, stretching strengthening on my body the crashes became less and less and then now are basically non-existent because the awareness has increased right it's the practice of it practice yep. of it all and i think for me you know when people talk about mindfulness and being mindful that's what it is the, the mm -hmm. constant reassessment it's not some woo woo thing where you just have to meditate and do all these things mindfulness just means paying attention right and mm -hmm. seeing you know where the trend is whether it's up or down or actually having that patience of okay, I need to do this a few more days in a row to really know. That's another mm -hmm. thing, too. You can't just do it like a day or two or even right. like you have, you have to put some time in and, and ride those things because you're going to have what you said, these catastrophes. And, well, maybe it's because you were too intense on that right. movement. It's not maybe don't throw away that movement, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a really hard thing to get across. Uh, and to, to clients, whether you're in person with them or, you know, over email or, you know, even conversations like this, cause it takes time. It takes mm -hmm. that, that trial and error and takes those repetitions to, for them to really understand it. Yeah. There, I mean, there are some stretches where you do it and you think, no, no, it's not, this is not going to work because I did it, you know, three times, but right. you know, maybe. Maybe it takes 15 times to even feel the right muscle doing something. Maybe it takes 15 you know, days before you even start to feel the right sensation in the right spot. Um, and I, I think that's something that, um, that people definitely are not taught in, say, PE class, like right. in a normal physical education scenario. Absolutely. Um, I, I think a lot of people, like with youth athletes, like, uh, like I have a... I, I went to a I went to a gymnastics gym once, just like an open gym to go mess around, just to see what it was like a couple of years ago. And there were these kids there who were probably like eight years old, um, and these were the buffest eight year old kids I had ever seen. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, so, man. <laughs> yeah. So, but like when you think about like those kids, you probably don't have to teach them paying attention closely to their stretching sure. at that point you're teaching them like here's the position get this position here's this position get this position and the the mindfulness that we're talking about for these elite youth athletes is going to be different right that the demand for mindfulness is different for a child who's developing flexibility right. versus a grown adult who's spent 20 25 30 40 years being stiff and are now having to reconnect to their muscles. So like, you know, I, I know there are these great YouTube videos of like young gymnast kids right. doing stretches and stuff. Like here's how you get your hamstring uh -huh. flexibility. But you know, for us adults, we gotta be, we gotta approach it differently, approach it slower, be more patient, really right. feel into it. Right. Yeah. And that's the nuance. Where are you in this kind of the scope of practice? Right. Mm. Are, are you younger? Are you older? Right. Have you had problems before? Have you had no problem before? And that's the nuance of all of this. And that's the nuance of guidance, right? Rather, right. Than, so when, when you're coaching someone or you're training someone or you're treating someone, if you're a therapist, it's not oh, telling them what to do. 
right? It's not giving right. them a handout of six exercises and then go here. The, the, the true guidance is, is working within that. Because you can, right. you know, I've, you can have the same couple of people and give them the same exercises, right? And have totally different outcomes. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. totally different. Yep. But you can also have the same great outcome as if you work with those two different people with the same six exercises and adjust it. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally do that, you know, and that's the that's good, well, therapy. But it's it's good training. It's good everything. Training, yeah, yeah. And I, I would add on to that that even in the same person, you can have right. different outcomes depending on where they're at in their journey. For example, yeah. When I started, I was kind of uh, the the weightlifter, but like muscle guy with a lot more muscle mass, and what I needed at that time was a lot of deep targeted tissue work and stretching to make my mm. hips feel better. But then as life changed and my priorities changed and I wasn't in the, in the, in the gym as much, I found that later on when I was kind of more like, call me a, like a yoga lifestyle, doing lots of stretching, lots mm. of that kind of stuff. I actually found that my hips started to not feel good when I drifted towards that end of the spectrum. It's like first mm. I was like the buff weightlifter and then I became like the skinnier yoga guy. Mm -hmm. And and I actually found that I needed to re-add, reintegrate some strength training and stability training back into my routine nice. to find my my optimal middle. So it's like it can – there's not like one hip impingement routine. There's a set of principles that you can follow but then there's some exploration that you've got to do. Yeah. Nice. Super important. Super important. And that's the whole uh, continual assessment, you know, yep. even within yourself. Um, yep. I'm getting a little bit older, right? Turned 45 last year. And it hit me more, say, a year and a half ago because I like squatting. I love it. Heavy mm. weights, everything. Bam, bam, bam. Every day, right? All these <laughs> things. And I could still do it. I could. But then I couldn't recover Right. Yeah. Because I'm doing other things. Now, if that was the only thing I would do, yeah, I could probably still do it. Right. Uh, but I, I like teaching martial arts, like training, I like doing all this stuff. Even, you know, the whole cliche, I like hiking around with my kids, I like doing that stuff. So yeah. I had to, and I'm not going to give, I don't have to give up the squatting. I don't. I, I did yesterday. But I have to give up what I used to be able to do before and, and go, okay. I don't have to do 350 pounds today. And I don't, <laughs> right? But 10 years ago, I was like, man, no way, I'm going to do this. So yeah. you have to, uh, to kind of look within yourself and be patient with yourself. I think, I I, I, I think um, what you just brought up is probably one of the hardest things oh, yeah. for most active people to, to deal with. I think for, for me, um, that has been that has been a real struggle and it was a real struggle. Um, like in my late twenties, early thirties, I was feeling like, sweet, I'm good. Like I can play hockey. I can lift heavy weights. I'm going to keep lifting, keep doing squatting, heavy deadlifting, go play hockey three right. times a week, all that Anything stuff. Anything you want. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, and then at some point kind of, I think it was in my mid thirties. Um, I realized like, the hockey, the weightlifting, working with clients, like all this stuff, this is a lot of stress. Right. And, and it, I'm not recovering. My body is tightening up. I don't feel as flexible. I don't feel like my hips are moving correctly anymore. And I realize, like, hey, I'm, I might actually have to dial this back. Right. And, right? Like, right. It's super <laughs> hard. It's super hard, especially if yeah. you, like, you hit it right there. If you were able to do it before, why can't I keep doing it? Yeah. That's massive. Yeah. That's massive. Yeah. And that's why, you know, the real good program, good trainers, they cycle. You cycle mm. through. You know, we're not saying give it up. You know, don't give it up. We're not, you should stop doing those things, Matt. You should stop <laughs> yeah. doing it totally. No way. But we can cycle through it. You can do it. It's just now you're thinking in terms of the year versus the week, right? right. Like, oh, I, and I, you know, I don't want to talk about me all the time, but the whole, th I did that this summer. I was like, okay, this is my weightlifting three months and nice. I was good. I, I turned, I, I didn't get rid of all the other stuff. I just kind of turned it down. Right. And mm -hmm. now I'm not doing that. I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm lifting like twice a week, barely, you know, mm -hmm. 20 minutes. Right. But I'm doing all my other stuff. So I think if we can 
get people to think about that a little bit more. I think that'll help rather than just like, oh, don't do this. Maybe just do this. No, you can do everything. It's got to be over time now, though. It's got to be over time. Right. I think it's important to say that um, you, all three of us on this call have training backgrounds and we know the science of how to you know, load and deload your body and uh, which training variables you can change. Oh, just change the volume and the intensity and the depth and the, you know, right. this and that and the other thing. Most people don't have absolutely. a, don't have a sense of that. So absolutely. one, I think it's important to let people know that nothing in life is black or white. It's not don't squat. If you have hip impingement, it's right. what type of squat to what depth, with what stance, with what shoes, with absolutely. what implement can you do? It's not, don't ever do the splits. If you have hip impingement, it's don't, push past really bad pain. Right. <laughs> it's like ex Absolutely. explore the explore the positions, maybe try different styles of stretching that maybe agree with your body a little bit more if you have something bony going on. So it's like know for anyone listening to this that there's many variables that you can train. It's not don't do this ever again. Don't squat ever again. That means don't sit on the toilet. Don't sit on a couch. Right. <laughs> it's like, exactly. Exactly. but if, if you're, if you're, if you're someone who likes to move, likes to be in the gym, know that there's a lot of variables. And if you don't happen to know off the top of your head, what they are, Google, YouTube, reach out uh -huh. to one of us and we'll let you know, Oh, you can do trap bar deadlifts. You can do exactly. Romanian deadlifts. You can do block pulls. You can do lunges variations. You can do single leg deadlifts. There's so many things that you can do practically that still allow you to train and feel like an athlete without having to completely give up all the things that you love. Absolutely. And it's more than just, or, you know, right now we're kind of focused on hip and FAI stuff, but fits everything, knees, shoulders, back, Mm -hmm. Even your general well-being, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I think um, piggyback on that is um, uh, I think it's really important for – there's going to be some people out there who are going through like uh, you know either hip, shoulder, back thing um, that flares up every time they do their favorite activity. Right. Uh, and this is – this goes right in line with that is you have to understand like you, you have to learn what your body needs to be able to do the activities you love. So if you're doing the activities you love right now and every time you do it, your body is in a lot of pain, you're probably going to need to step back and assess yourself, figure out what's the missing link, what's the weak link here that I need to work on so that when I do the thing I love, it doesn't result in me lying on the couch for three days, right? right. So, and again, for active people, for athletes, that's, that's very difficult to digest. And also, it's very important to do because it means you're going to get back to the thing you love sooner if you can figure out what the weak link is sooner. Right, right? absolutely, so. absolutely. It's a... Uh... You know, we talked a little bit about patience and, and things like this. Uh, I did a podcast with one of our trainers, Rose. You know, man, mm -hmm. it's like she's over in Santa Cruz. And we yeah. talked about that in, in our pain. You know, we're talking about chronic pain and what, what do you do when you know, something happens and how do you get back into it? And a lot of it is, is that. It's not just simply we've we got to stop and like not, never do it again. It's, it's, it's having this really systematic approach of, of figuring out what it is, getting back into it, figuring out what it is, getting back into it, right, and all right. that stuff. And that's what I'm hearing a lot from, from you guys. So these, those last two things, I thought, you know, what you, Shane, said about you know, where you are in your journey, right? And also realizing that it's not a black and white, you know, don't do this, you know, don't squat, don't do splits. That's another thing, too, that I was like with the FAI thing or, or, or do you have hip, you know, antiversion or retroversion all that when people talk say these things to me and you know it's bad because you know they're being sincere and like man maybe i have this because i can't squat like this and right. i just go i just go ah it doesn't really matter man and i can't <laughs> say that though because i can't you, it's you know you're being an asshole if you just like totally dismiss <laughs> their concerns but it's true though right <laughs> right and 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 here matt what you said about being active and and having being used to being able to do a thing and now you can't that's massive you know those are those are really important concepts for everyone to kind of get their heads around is there with that like now to kind of wrap everything up what what are like one or two really important takeaways that you would want someone to to get out of your material and, and what we've talked about here i have um 
three practical things that come to mind that I think would immediately make a difference for people. One is to figure out what's going on in your body. I remember back when it was like a mystery, what was wrong. And that was the most debilitating and disempowering thing to not know why this was happening to me. It's just like, I don't know. It just starts hurting when I do stuff. One of the best ways to figure out why it's actually happening, because there is reasons, several reasons probably, is to start a, you could call it a mobility practice. I would call it kind of like an exploration, a mobility practice, a mindfulness practice. But basically doing, we in our FAI Fix program, we have it's basically sort of powered by what we call the TSR system, which stands for tissue work, stretching, and re-education or strength training or reactivation training. So I like those three things because like if something's going wrong with your body, like what can you actually do to make yourself feel better? You can't give yourself a chiropractic adjustment. You can't give yourself acupuncture. You can't perform surgery on yourself. Like what can you really do? You can massage muscles. You can stretch them. You can strengthen them and you can learn how to move better. So if you just have a, a daily practice, it could be short, it could be long, whatever you have available where you're pressing on things, you're massaging things in different ways with different tools and different implements. And I'm not just talking about foam rolling. That's like the 101 course. It goes much more profound than that. Same thing with stretching. Um, explore stretches, like touch your end ranges, like see how your hips feel in this direction, in this direction. And don't just like static stretch and just hang out there. There's nothing wrong with static stretching, but get into a stretch-like position and then explore. Contract some muscles, do some contracting the agonist muscle, the antagonist, like just play around, explore. It's kind of like a, ga a game. Make it very GMB-like. Um, <laughs> and then also strengthen things. There's usually um, some underactivity of some muscles, some some weakness. And if you if you do that diligently and regularly, massage some things, stretch some things, strengthen some, some things, and you're doing these tests and retests regularly, you're going to unravel the mystery. The, the, the reason why your hips hurt starts to become clearer and clearer and clearer. And if you also can do that, that's kind of like an internal practice, like you're doing all those experiments on yourself. And if you also can have the outside help of someone like Jarlo, Matt, myself, um, an outside pair of eyes that can tell you, oh, you thought you were you were in neutral pelvic position when you were doing that hip hinge. You actually were highly anteriorly pelvic right. tilted. And maybe maybe that would help. Like I didn't know that when I first started and I needed a coach to, to like look at me and be like, hey, dummy, look what you're doing on the video right. there. Absolutely. So that outside help is really helpful along with that internal kind of TSR mobility practice. Um, I agree with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Times two on that. And I, I think um, what I would want to add to that is the, the mental side of all this is, um, you know, we've, we talked about like, you know, you have to stay motivated and one way that can be helpful to keep yourself motivated is to first set an ambitious goal. This is something that we talk about with all of our clients. We have it in the FAI fix. It's the first thing is to set some sort of goal that actually inspires you. So, you know, whether it's I want to be able to play hockey, you know, without pain once a week, or I want to be able to do a jar low level internal rotation in a deep squat, right? Like whatever it is, find the inspiration that makes you go, yeah, I should be able to do that. I want to do that. And then you're not going to hit that right away. And right. so when you hit the frustration, which will come, um, when you hit those moments of frustration, I really encourage people to do what Shane was talking about uh, earlier on this call, which was look at the trend. And so if you rewind one month and then rewind three months and rewind six months, 12 months, mentally looking at all those snapshots and seeing like, what was I able to do a year ago? What was I able to do two years ago? Am I improving? That can make such a big difference if you just get present to what kind of changes you are making. I, I know for me, I used to hit these lows where I'd just be like, man, like I'm not ever going to be able to do this. I'm not getting anywhere. And then I would just look back even like a month and be like, well, okay, maybe I'm making progress and maybe I'll put in the work today and do it yeah. some more. <laughs> Perspective is hard. Perspective is super hard. Yeah, yeah. It really is. I'm yeah. glad to hear you say that. <laughs> I, I think from, for, you know, for humans, we're kind of, we tend to be really focused on like how do what's this short term short term future, right? Absolutely. Like, 
now and then like five minutes into the future that's where i think we excel with our attention but yeah absolutely and, it, and it's, it's also i uh, talked about this with a couple of friends yeah. it's, it's also the emotional emotionality of this and you know, anything mm-hmm. physical and and things you, that you're actually really enjoy and just passionate about too right yeah. and physicality and, and you know even in your other hobbies and things like that you become this attached to it and that's why the perspective is hard because you just you want it so much yeah right yeah it's hard to have that patience perspective and that nuance right and there's a but shane had just talked about too it's like play with it and, and kind of explore with it and do all these things and, and that's the really what we've been trying to get at over the years to a lot of people is that you know it almost doesn't matter what kind of training you like to do right is uh right. do you enjoy it can you be consistent with it can you play with it and still have progress we're not saying don't make you know just be happy with where you are. That's not what we're saying. You have to have that that goal you talked about, Matt, right? That that goal and get there. But it doesn't mean you have to be so hyper focused that you just lose all perspective and you're like, oh man, I'm not getting it. Because then that's the path to like just fully burning out and not get, totally. getting anywhere, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah I it's, think, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jane. I was just gonna say it's the, it's that mythical and hard to attain, but nevertheless true have a big goal, be 100% committed to it. And at the same time, hundred percent unattached about getting right. there. Like if you stumble and fall and you don't get there, smile, start again, start something right. new. It's hard. And that's where it's really useful to have a coach or a training partner, even, you know, someone yeah. outside just kind of helping you with that. So, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned, um, earlier that you like to hike with your kids and, um, you know, I, I just had a kid almost two years and um, the experience of having a kid has gotten me much more compassionate to people who are grown adults who have kids right? because the time that you have available to work with your body, to pay attention to your body um, is a lot more limited than if you're, you know, 20 years old and single right. you know so for for those people who are parents out there i think it's really important to know you know if you, if you want to make progress you do need to set aside time and also know hey you know you can't you probably can't maintain six hours of training every day right. for Absolutely. Days it's not going to happen right. so be be compassionate with yourself and adjust and you know, be a realistic and yeah. be patient. And I think even acknowledging that is super important. And again, it's not like you're saying, we're not saying you're never going to make progress. You're never going to do that. That's right. not, it's not true. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, guys. Really, really great conversation. I had a lot of fun. Uh, for everyone, again, this is Shane Dowd, Matt Chu, the FAI Fix guys. But uh, in our show notes, we'll give you links. Also, too, Shane had mentioned that... Uh, had a blog post uh, doing a guest blog post for us that should be out soon or maybe at the same time as we release this podcast uh lots of other things thanks so much for taking the time guys really appreciate it thank you so much jarla yeah jarla thank you so much for taking the time and this chat and for uploading random videos of yourself in the garage i mean <laughs> you've been an inspiration to thousands <laughs> well thanks appreciate that it. is my job now random videos in the garage all right same so all, right. <laughs> all right take care guys All right, take care. Bye. 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 Bye.